I want to start by saying thank you for the wonderful reaction that we shared last week after my scathing sermon on fruitcake. I think that would be. <laughs> Who knew that fruitcake would be the thing that divides this congregation, right? <laughs> I had people walking out of the, of the church and some would whisper, I don't like them either. Like, you know, it's like if, if they say it out loud, they're going to get in trouble. And I also had people who just walked by and said, Claxton, and they walk off like it's a code word, like Claxton. Well, as someone graciously left this week for me, they're talking about the uh, Claxton fruit cake. Still unopened, just want to let you know that. But I know that Christmas came early because I also got a wonderful gift from Grover and Doris, so I think I'll choose this over the fruit cake. Girls, you like you like fruit cake, don't you? You sure? No? Okay, all right. I know someone who does like fruit cake. Yes, because here all means all. Exactly. Well, Christmas continues to come early for me. Last week I had a chance to talk to you about Malachi. And this week, I get to talk about Zephaniah. Woo, yeah, all right, let's all calm down. The book of Zephaniah takes place during the, king, the reign of King Josiah. Now, to impress all your family and friends, you can let them know that Josiah is one of only two kings that are praised by the Old Testament prophets, the other being Hezekiah. Now, Zephaniah is only three chapters long, but he packs quite a punch in those chapters. Last week I said that whatever we read about the prophets, it is a safe bet to assume that the prophets are responding to something bad that the Israelites have done again. Another thing to keep in mind, whenever the prophets do speak, they never begin with happy talk. It's like that one friend that you know who calls you or messages you only when they have a complaint. And when you see their name pop up on your phone or your email or text messages, you know exactly why they are calling and you say a silent prayer hoping that you are not the one that they're going to complain about. Well, the people know why the prophets are preaching. And when the book of Zephaniah begins, the prophet makes a list. And if the prophet is making a list, that's not usually a good sign. Now, this list is all the people who have upset God. It's quite the list, and no one is safe. You have people and nations who worship other gods. You have Judah, Jerusalem on the list, false priests, humans, animals, birds, fish. All means all on this list. But here is what makes God so upset. There are people who are going around saying that God will not do harm or good. God is just there, watching, not doing anything. So these people are taunting God. They are making fun of God. And need I remind you that it is never a good idea to taunt God. So Zephaniah shares God's response to the taunts, and he starts the book by talking about God the hunter, hunting those who have ridiculed God, and hunting those who have helped turn the children of God away from him. So Zephaniah's story begins very similarly like John the Baptist's. Zephaniah and John both start out from a point of anger. You can tell John is angry because his first words to the people are not words of welcome. They are words of warning and insults. He calls the people a brood of vipers. Now, how much of an insult is this to the people? On a scale of insults, where would it rank? Well, it ranks pretty high. The Old Testament associates the serpent with Satan back in Genesis 3. And the viper was seen as an evil creature. Its venom was deadly, and it was also devious. It is a viper hidden in the firewood that bites Paul in Acts 28. And vipers populated the area of the desert 
where John lived. And vipers would rush away. They would slither away very quickly from their hiding places whenever those brushes caught fire due to the dryness of the air. And to top it all off, the viper was associated with a spiteful, backstabbing person. So, in review, John is calling the people cowardly backstabbers who are children of Satan. All right? So that's a pretty strong insult. I don't think he would have even gotten any uh, uh, levity if he had said, with all due respect, before he said it. But while Zephaniah and John start out with words of anger, both of them do end with words of hope. I like how Luke ends our lesson by saying John went on to preach the good news. And many of us, after reading the lesson, probably are saying, there was good news in that? Where was it? Because calling names isn't exactly a gospel-friendly approach. But the words of hope come in the forms of water, kindness, and justice. Water for washing away the old sins, the old self, and washed anew with life-giving water. Or kindness, as displayed by Pastor Mark so well, with the offering of a coat to someone who needs it. Or justice for separation of the good and the bad, a leveling of the playing field, or justice when it came to economics, telling the tax collectors, don't take more than what you're supposed to, or the soldiers by saying, stop threatening people or extorting them. So this is where water, kindness, and justice are good news to the people. For Zephaniah, the words of hope comes in the form of a song, of which we read today in our lesson. Now guess who the singer is? It is God. God goes from God the hunter to God the singer. And the good news is that God is not only singing to the Israelites, God is singing to us. And the words of this song not only pertain to the Israelites, they connect with us today. Let me read them again. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The king of Israel is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home. At that time, I gather you. For I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. What a wonderful song. What wonderful poetry. What wonderful words. And these words show that God is not an absent God. God is not away. God is in our midst. God is near. And when I say near, I'm not saying if you call someone, say, I'm nearby, two lights away. No, God is near as in, in this place, right near us. God is near us, and God is singing to us. I could hear God singing these words loud and clear just last Sunday when we baptized sweet little Virginia Myers. I could hear God singing as Virginia kept reaching for the font. Pastor Mark remembers that, Deacon Susan. As she was right at the font, she kept reaching for it, kept reaching for it, and reminded me how we run to the water. We reach for the water to be cleansed from our sins. It also reminded me of how we run to God, just like the people in our lesson from Luke. And then later on, I believe it was her cousin Davis. Davis came running up, towards the altar. Now, what does every good parent say to the child as they run up to the altar? Don't touch anything. 
stop, halt. Well, I saw Davis as he was running up. I heard the song of God because Davis was wanting to get as close to God as possible, even daring to touch the railing and the altar, which is perfectly fine. There's nothing forbidden about this space. But the song even had a third verse in communion where on several occasions the wafer was sticking to my hand. Couldn't give it to people. And it reminded me, now bear with me, and this is the eye roll part, it reminded me that God sticks by us and God sticks to us. It's okay, I'll leave after this, I promise, okay? But I'll leave you the fruitcake just in case. But the main thing is that we cannot get rid of God. And God's song goes on forever. And there are new verses being added all the time. Verses that include Virginia and Davis and even wafers. And verses like the hanging of the Crispon trees. Like yesterday where it was loud and people were talking and that noise was the song of Christ. And verses that include donations to very important and needed nonprofits like Mother Hubbard's Cupboard and meals to family promise and the meals on Monday nights, just to name a few things, and the meal that we share each and every Sunday. Each verse in the song leads us to rejoice, for God is in our midst. And we can rejoice, for God will make things right. God will make things new. And no matter what happens in our lives, God is singing. Amen.